Do you remember the promise of the rainbow? My last sermon was called, what was it called? A rainbow to remember. Oh, very good, Ramy. You get the star. A rainbow to remember. Today I want to connect something to the promise of the rainbow, something else, something very important. Now remember, the rainbow is the creator's bow that he set in the clouds, his own words, as we read in Genesis chapter 9. And he set it in the clouds as a sign of his everlasting covenant with the whole earth. And this is a sign that God can be trusted because he keeps his promises. It's a sign of divine love, really. I want today to connect mothers to the promise of the rainbow. Christian mothers. God wants mothers to give their hearts to Christ. Isn't that true? Amen. And for mothers who've given their hearts to Christ, he wants them to raise their children to know that God is love, to raise them in the knowledge of Jesus. Do you believe that? Amen. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I pray today, this Sabbath morning, for a special blessing on Christian mothers, those who have known the struggle to raise their children in the Lord and those who are just getting to know it. And I also ask for a blessing upon all of your daughters, O Lord, both young and old, that they may be filled with divine compassion for souls and that they may become workers in your vineyard to seek and save the lost. Let's include the men and the boys in the prayer too. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of my sermon today is Mothers for Evangelism. Now, I got to tell you, um, I struggled with this title. I almost called it something else, and you'll know what that something else is in a little bit. But before I get there, let me ask you, how familiar are you with the book of Isaiah. Raise your hand if you say you have some familiarity with the book of Isaiah. I don't see too many hands going up. Are you just shy or what, you know? Come on, play with me, please, you know? Um, and specifically today, I'm going to look at Isaiah chapter 49. Now, it is written to God's church, specifically, Isaiah 49. To God's what? In those days, the days of Isaiah, God's church was called Israel, kingdom of Judah, kingdom of Israel. But in the book of Isaiah, he calls it Israel, and he calls them by a special name. He calls them my servant. God calls them his servant, my servant. Now, the idea of God's servant in the book of Isaiah, as I'm trying to find my chapter 49, here it is. Had a marker there, should have known. The idea of God's servant in the book of Isaiah, and specifically here in chapter 49, is that Israel is to be a light to the Gentiles. And Christians should know who the Gentiles are. The Gentiles are, well... In the days of Jesus, they were not Jews. But in a spiritual sense, they're basically people who are not Christians yet. In the New Testament interpretation of that, I guess you'd say. So Israel was supposed to be a light to the rest of the world. Because to, the rest, because to Israel, the rest of the world were Gentiles. And there is another thing in Isaiah 49 that's intertwined. There's an interplay between the words with my servant. If you have a study Bible, your English Bible will sometimes have it capitalized, my servant, meaning it's talking about the Messiah. And sometimes it's lowercase, means it's talking about Israel. So this interplay is between Israel and the Messiah. Both are called my servant. It's prophecies of the Messiah. We know that to be Jesus, right? We know that today, of course. So in Isaiah 49, we see this interplay between 
my servant meaning Jesus, and my servant meaning the whole church, or the Old Testament church. Nowadays, it would be to the New Testament church. So, in fact, God's servant is both, both the Messiah and the church. But there was a problem, not with the Messiah, with guess who? With God's people, with the church. Because of their sins, they thought that God had forgotten them. So the Messiah, because of their thoughts and because of the sins, had to take up an extra work, not only to be a light to the Gentiles, but now the Messiah also has to be a light to God's own people, a light to the church. So think about it this way. If the church was perfect, the church would already be fixed and know its role and be doing God's will, and God wouldn't have to do too much work on them, would he? But I guess you know by experience that that's not the case from both the Old Testament, the New Testament, and our day-to-day. Isn't that true? God's always working on behalf of his church because sometimes we get distracted and could go astray. Isn't that true? So the problem with the church, we find this coming out in Isaiah chapter 49. The Messiah taking up a work to be a light to both the Gentiles and to Israel. So this brings us to my opening scripture, which Mort already read, and I'm going to read again. Starting with verse 14 from Isaiah 49. But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. Verse 15. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hand, as if Jesus is talking directly to us, to his people. Inscribed us on the palms of his hand. God has not forgotten us. We have been inscribed on the bloodstained hands of Jesus. So why do we still have problems with not remembering that God remembers us with every promise he's made? That's really what the purpose of church is, to help us remember, isn't it? When we come together, we help each other remember. That's the purpose of prayer meetings. It's the purpose of getting together. That's the purpose of Christian families, isn't it? And that's the purpose of mothers. A mother's first work, really, is to care for her children, to raise her children. Have you ever heard of a mother not having compassion on the children of her womb? You ever heard of that? In our day-to-day, of course you have. Not all mothers are good mothers. And God takes that into account because God says, surely they might even forget. Or as the King James says, yea, they might forget, but I will not forget. Maybe this is why we have a problem. And when I say we, I mean us as human beings collectively, especially believers. Maybe this is why we have a problem remembering that God does remember us. We forget that God does not forget us. We forget that he remembers us. You ever been through struggles? You ever been through depression? You ever go through like, well, am I good enough to come before God? You know, there's a lot of scriptures like, I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks under his wings, a mother chicken. A hen gathers the chicks under her wings, but the Bible says, but you were unwilling to Israel. And there's so many other scriptures that God and Jesus compare mothers with the Messiah, mothers with the love of God, because there's nothing more tender than the love of a mother. Yeah, the love of a father can be pretty tender, but really the most tender love of all has got to be the love of a mother for her children. And the love of those children for the mother. In fact, today is my mother's birthday. She died five and a half years ago. She would have been 89 years old today. And, you know, I love my mother, but I know she wasn't the best mother in the world. I mean, I can see that, I can just look and compare and see some Christian mothers that, wow, what a good mother. 
but that did not reduce my mother's my love for my mother. And I'm sure my mother thought, well, Dean's not the best son in the world either. He could probably see there's children that are better, you know. Sometimes we Christians can look at children. I know I taught school for many years. We can look at children and say, why are those children so good? How come my children aren't that good? You know what I'm saying? I look at families and say, wow, now that's a Christian family. And I look at other families like my own and say, what happened? Did I not do a good job? You know, we, Tracy and I, we parents, we sometimes yearn over decisions our children make and even our adult children make. And we yearn for them what? To be saved, to come to Christ. To come to Christ. May I tell you a story? Pay attention. You might want to write some notes down. A long time ago, a family whose surname was Wunsterborn came to this country seeking the freedoms and opportunities found here. They were not Christians per se. In fact, many of them tended to shun religion as time went on and more generations of Wunsterborns were born. The newer generations became more and more diverse and as a result, when you examine their family tree, today you will find them spread out, this is a fact, I've done the research, I know, spread out amongst the various religions, politics, and philosophies found here in America. It's actually a pretty big family. Who are the Wunsterborns? All of us. All of us. For we were all once born. Or if we say it slower, and I pronounce it more correctly, once they're born. Once they're born, who cares for them? It starts with the mother. Or another caregiver if there's an adoption. What is the hottest political button in today's American society? Come on, shout it out because you know you've been reading abortion. And why is that so? Because somebody did something that's never happened before in the history of America. Somebody leaked what the Supreme Court was working on in regards to abortion and Justice Alito's majority opinion, which is not even final yet from what we understand from reading more things in the paper, was first written back in February. These things are to be top secret. Well, it got leaked that they're going to overturn Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade from the 1970s. They're going to overturn is the, the, the fear of many the federal protection for abortion. And they say, and I don't want to get all into it, you know, but they say that uh, the arguments, is, from what I understand it, from the majority, the five on the court that are voting to overturn it, or might vote to overturn it because it hasn't been done yet, that it's poorly worded, poorly written. I've read many legal arguments the same way. I even agree with that. And they say it really should be returned to the states. And so the fear is because if they overturn it, once they overturn it, for the unborn, now, we're not talking about once the borns. We're talking about unborn. Once they overturn it, then it's up to the states, and about half of our 50 states are on one side and half are on the other, and so to get a legal abortion, you'd have to go to a state where it's legal. And, you know, and there's all kinds of arguments. I, I read one argument from some female senator from New York, which I thought was poorly thought out, who said, you know, men don't understand a woman's body is her body. And how would you like, men? You have a power over your body. You have authority over your body. You have a right over your body. But we women don't. If they, if they make abortion, um, if they outlaw it or they strike down Roe v. Wade, women will have no authority over their body. I say, well, that depends on how, what your worldview is and how you're thinking. If you think your body only belongs to you and you can do whatever you want with it, I want to cut my finger off, I'll cut it off. I want to get a tattoo, I'll get that tattoo. I want to comb my hair weird, I'll comb it weird. I want to comb it neat, I'll comb it neat. I want to dress in a suit or if I want to dress in holy Levi's, you know, my choice. If I want to scratch myself up, if I want to injure myself, if I want to use drugs, or if I want to have a healthy lifestyle, it's my body, my choice, right? The ultimate in human rebellion. But what's the Bible say to us who know God? You are not your own. 
You have been bought with a price. You're to glorify God in your body. So I imagine the way God looks at a woman's body who's carrying a child, an unborn, that now you have something special to care for. And most mothers, I believe, feel that way because there's a special connection between mothers and their children. Now, I want you to consider this carefully. I'm not here to advocate for or against abortion. I'm here to advocate for the once the borns. I can't do anything about the unborn, and neither can you. I can't do anything about the political opinions that are on the right and the left that divide us, even within God's churches. There are opinions on both sides of this abortion debate. And I'm telling you, this, like other issues I've talked about in the past, are really red flags to get us off what we're really to be focusing upon. Amen. God's work. And I'm not saying we should not advocate against abortion. I'm not in favor of it, but I know there's also circumstances that, you know, we can't ju- just make it cart bl- You know what I'm saying? But I know com- God has compassion. He says even if the mother forgets the children of her womb to not have compassion, I will not forget. God is like that special mother who doesn't forget God knows all the unborn, and God knows all the born. But here's my beef. It's not just my beef, but it's others' beef. Abortion did not all of a sudden just become a political hot button. It's been for a long time. There's a rallying cry from the left and from the right on both sides. Both are very violent in their rally. There's a scripture that says, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. And the proper interpretation of that scripture, that word violence, means those who are going into it are pressing into it. People are trying to find the kingdom of heaven. They're trying to know Jesus. They're trying to find true life because anybody who's been once born does not have it because everyone who's a Christian knows you must be twice born. You must be born again or you have no hope of eternal life. Everybody who's ever been once born, this family of once the borns, I, my heart goes out to them. I was once a once to born. I hope I'm not a once to born anymore. I want to be a second born. I want to be born again. How about you? Amen. Do you understand what I'm saying? Why is it in our society, even among Christians, we allow these hot button issues to be the focus of what we get angry about, what we get mad about, and what we debate about, and we let Satan do his dirty work to get these poor red flags that look like they're urgent, that look like they're necessary, because they might be, but there's something more urgent and more necessary. Why is it so many people will rally for the unborn? I guess just like about people who rally for their dogs and animals, you know, and I care about dogs and animals. But it seems to me that there are certain people that rally more for animals than they do for people. They would save a dog before they would save a human. And it seems to me there are more people that rally for the unborn that care nothing about the once-borns. What does the Bible say? Ooh, let's go on a little journey here. Mm. Who are the once-borns? They are the hungry and the thirsty. They are the sick and the naked, those who were uncovered. Remember when Adam knew he was naked, God provided a covering for him. They are the stranger and the prisoner. They are the widow and the orphan. They are the ones who Jesus, well, the ones who minister to them. See, God says, to Israel, to his church today, not just the Messiah, but we all, y'all, all of us who claim to be born again in Christ, that we are, all are to be a light to the Gentiles. We are to be a light to those who've been born the first time, any human being on the face of the earth. And Jesus says for those who minister, minister to them, the hungry, the thirsty, the sick, the naked, the prisoner, the stranger, the orphan, and the widow, what does James write? James 1.27, pure and undefiled religion is this, 
that you should visit orphans and windows, widows and their affliction and keep yourself unspotted from the world. Isn't that true? We're going to look at some more scriptures on that. But Jesus says to, he separated the sheep from the goats. You know it's in Matthew 25. He separated the who? The sheep from the goats. And what did he say to the sheep? Come, you blessed by my father into the kingdom of heaven. What did he say to the goats? He said, depart from me, you wicked who didn't know they were wicked. They thought they did what God wanted them to do. But what did he say? What did Jesus say to those on his right hand? He said, come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you, for you from the foundation of the world. <coughs> Excuse me. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Hmm. When did we see you naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, And surely I say to you, Inasmuch as you have done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. You've ministered to what Dean Reed called you today, and you'll never forget this now, right? The Wonsterborns. And if you help, need help with it, let me put it to you this way. Wonster rhymes with Munster, and they shorten their name from Wonsterborn to Wonster. You want to be a Wonster or you want to be a secondborn? You know what I'm saying? Our job is to find the Wonsters, to find those who've all been born on this earth, and to be a light to the Gentiles, to give them hope. Now think about this. Can a mother forget her sucking child and not have compassion on the child of her womb? Who? I ask, who will have compassion on the once they're borns, that they may be born again, born of water and the Spirit, as Jesus says in Matthew 3. You know, Jesus, Nicodemus came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 3. Nicodemus came to Jesus hiding in the night. You know that famous chapter. And he says, I, I know you're a great teacher. No one can do these things that you do. No one can do them. And then in verse 5 of John 3, Jesus straight out answers Nicodemus as if he's ignoring his entreaties and cuts right to the point, not only for Nicodemus, but for all of us today. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Everyone's been once born, but not everyone has been born again. You must be born again, Jesus said. You must be born of water and the Spirit. The message we have as Christians, and especially we as Seventh-day Adventists, the three angels' message, the last message of mercy to a dying planet, dying planet, must include the call to a God who's calling them to be saved, to give people the hope of salvation, not to wait to their dying day and say, okay, God saved me at the last minute. I mean, I guess that's okay if that happens, but how rare it is. More than likely, people who put off God keep putting off God up to their dying day. That's why the Bible says, now is a day of salvation. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, now is the day of salvation. Now is the day to choose. That's why... It's written of Joshua to Joshua. And God gave it to Joshua, and Joshua gave it to the church, to the people. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods that your fathers serve on the other side of the flood, or the God of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Praise God for the mothers who raise their children to know Jesus. And even those of our mothers who've done that, I know a little bit of your pain because I'm a father. I know what it is to see children leave. 
Many of our mothers at both Griffin and Thomason have had adult children that are no longer walking in the faith of Jesus. How they must yearn, how they must ask, like I've asked myself, like many of you parents have asked, what did we do wrong? Pray, pray, pray. God is on their side. God says he will not forget them. Let's look at some other reassuring scriptures. Check this out. Jeremiah 31, verses 15 to 17. Thus says the Lord. This is a prophecy that was fulfilled in the time of Jesus when he was born on earth. But it's still to be fulfilled today. Jeremiah 31, verses 15 to 17. Thus says the Lord. A voice was heard in Ramah. Lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children. Why? Do you know why? The Bible says because they are no more. Thus says the Lord, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. For your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord. And they shall come back. From where? From the land of the enemy. There is hope in your future, says the Lord, that your children shall come back to their own borders. Ah. Now we need to take a little bit of a journey through Isaiah 49 to see this even more. Who are these once the borns? Who are these children? Who are your children? When Cynthia was up there and said, how about ants? Then she said, how about those who care for children, even though they've never been a biological mother? See, God is that type of mother. Even a man could be that type of mother if there's no one else. Who will fill that role that's meant to be filled by the Christian mother? It's her first priority. That's why I pray for the blessing. How God has destroyed, not God, excuse me, how Satan has destroyed families by attacking marriage, by coming up with abortion, by coming up with all these alternatives, by coming up with lust, 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 and more lust to distract the eye, by coming up with sexual immorality, where Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, flee sexual immorality is the only sin against the human body. Why does it tell us that? Because that sin will capture you. Whether it's hetero or homo sexual type of sins, it doesn't matter. Whether it's pornography, not just men now, but women, boys and girls, even 10-year-olds, they can get it. This will capture the hearts and minds. We are warned to stay away from it. And the only person who can keep you away from it is who? Once you grow up and your mother's not there to keep you away from who? You. And do you know how strong temptation is to drive you to look at what you shouldn't look at? Do you remember how Ham was cursed for looking upon his own father's nakedness? Yet there's nakedness all around us that we look upon. You know, there's another kind of nakedness that we need to cover, to cover the naked, to clothe the naked. There's a lot, the majority of our society from Hollywood and on out, that dress in such scanty clothes and parade themselves and women are treated as idols and boys are growing up to, th to think that that's what they need to look up to when God is reaching out to them with his eternal love. And that's sucking Christians right out of the church because we're all subject to it. Every last one of us. Because we all have an attraction to sin. Who can deliver us from this body of death? Thanks be to God, Paul writes in Romans 8, for Jesus Christ the righteous. So with my mind, I serve the law of God. But with my body, I know I serve the law of sin. Who's in control of you? Your body or your mind? Mothers, how will you raise your children? Fathers, how do you teach your sons to keep it zipped up? I'm quoting a father I once knew, a Christian father who had a good son. He wasn't afraid to tell him to keep it zipped up when he was a teenager. Who does that today? My father didn't do that for me. My father wasn't a Christian. In fact, fathers like I had, and I love my father, and he was a good dad. But in the world, fathers actually encourage their children to go out and be loose. You don't even need help from the parents. The world does it anyway. Who encourages daughters 
daughters of God, once baptized, twice born, born again, born of water and the Spirit, but the next day comes, and it's hard, because days are long, aren't they? You can pray in the morning, be walking with God in the morning, and days are long. And you can slip up at the end of the day and feel unworthy of God. But God says, they may forget, but I will not forget you. Look at this. Verse 18, Isaiah 49. Lift up your eyes, look around and see. All these gather together and come to you. As I live, says the Lord, you shall surely clothe yourselves with them as all as an ornament and bind them on you as a bride does. He's talking about children of the world who are becoming children of God, who God's people, God's church mentored, fathered, mothered, spiritually speaking, became those spiritual mothers and those spiritual fathers. You know, there are people who actually adopt children because they want to raise them right, and there's competition for that adoption, isn't there? We know our own Brian and Cindy adopted Savannah. Praise God for what Savannah received. But what about the children adopted by those who are not Christian? And I won't even go anyplace else from there. You know what I'm talking about? What hope do those children have to know the Lord if they're adopted by parents that don't care about the Lord? Who will teach them about the Lord? There are others who can spiritually adopt them. You might come across the stranger, the widow, the orphan, as Scripture talks about. The naked, because they're uncovered, because they're, they're living in sin. Seven billion people in the world, I would venture to say at least six billion are like this. That's not even close. It's, it's even 6.7 billion, maybe. How many true Christians are there really? How many true followers of God who are struggling to live above sin, without sin, to go away from sin, and at the same time to be compassionate on others? Now, here's where we have to be careful. Here's where we have to be careful. James 5, verse 19 and 20. Last two verses of the book. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth. Who are we talk, what are we talking about today? We're talking about mothers, right? But we're talking more about mothering children, aren't we? Raising children right. Mothers, if your children wander from the truth. We're talking about mothers for evangelism. I am trying to convince you, as I asked you last week, do Seventh-day Adventists believe in evangelism or not? Because most churches really don't. But we do. And I said last week, if you don't believe in evangelism, then you're really not Seventh-day Adventists. Because it's, it's in our main message from Revelation 14 to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And say it with a loud voice that God loves them. Fear God. Give glory to Him. To talk about the hour of His judgment that it's come. And to worship Him properly, which includes the keeping of the Seventh-day Sabbath and keeping God's law, doesn't it? And what many Adventists miss is that judgment is not a bad judgment. It's a good judgment because the Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 7, it's the judgment that's going on right now, and it's the judgment in favor of the saints. You want to be in this judgment. You want to get them saved now so they can be in that judgment. Because when Jesus comes again, contrary to what the left behind people believe, the secret rapture, it's done. Probation will close before Jesus comes. And then it's too late to save anybody. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time for us to be the mothers to the Gentiles, a light to the Gentiles. It's the time for our families to step up and be those good mothers to their children so they can grow up and be those good mothers and fathers too to set the example. We've got to reverse this trend that the devil's been doing on our world. God's people need to step out and relate with the world but not sin like the world. What does it say in Galatians chapter 6? If anyone falls away from the truth, you who are spiritual, go back and save your brother. But it says, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Sometimes we think about that considering yourself means, oh, I can't go over there. I might be tempted. And that's not what it means. You read the context of Galatians chapter 6. To consider yourself means be careful you don't judge them. Be careful you don't condemn them. Because once you start judging, once you start condemning, you're in danger of being tempted. You're actually being tempted. You've fallen from grace. This is what the Bible speaks about. 
We should not be afraid to go to the broken people of the world because we might be tempted. The only thing you'll be tempted on is to judge them and not to be compassionate on them and not to have patience with them like God has had patience with each one of us. Has he not had patience with you? How, how long have you been in the church? I've been in the church over 40 years. I think I've been a Christian most of my life, which is now going on 65 years. But talk about ups and downs. You think God's had patience with me? You better believe he has. I used to be, and still can be, a very impatient person. I used to be condemnatory and judgmental. My tendency is that way. God had to make me born again and again to come out of the, look at those people over there. Oh, they're not following the Lord. Instead of, look at those people over there. How can I reach out to them? Like I would want a Christian mother, if I was her child, to reach out to me. Actually, I did have a Christian mother in my grandmother because she taught me the love of Jesus. Fortunately, she lived across the street. So the extended family group can teach the love of Jesus. If your children do not know the love of Jesus, they do not know Jesus. If you don't know the love of Jesus, I'm not talking intellectually. I mean really know that you are a loving person yourself. You do not know the Lord. One of the tendencies of Seventh-day Adventists, because we know the law, we know the doctrines, we know intellectually so much more truth than everybody else put together. The tendency is to be very judgmental, condemnatory, and legalistic. We must be careful of that. We must have patience on one another. Allow people to grow in faith before you say, uh, got to change your diet. You got to change your clothes. You got to take off that jewelry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's all the outside of the cup. Do you see the inside of the cup? If you do not see the inside of the cup, you do not see them as Jesus sees them. And you are therefore not a light to them. Instead, you're darkness. And I've seen so much of that in my own faith group, even though I know this is the truth. But this is also the truth that I'm talking about today. We need to get to know God as a loving God. Amen. Look at this. Mark 3.31, one of three places is written. Then his brothers and his mother came, and standing outside, they said to him, to Jesus, and they're calling him, and a multitude was sitting around him, because he was teaching them, right? And they said to him, the multitude said to Jesus, Look, your mother. Who? Who? Your mother and your brothers, they're outside seeking you. But Jesus used it as a teaching moment to show them who his mother and brothers truly are. And it wasn't a biological relationship. Because he said, who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at all those around him. And he said, here are my mother and my brothers for whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. More from Isaiah 49. Verse 20. The children you will have after you have lost the others. Whoo, remember Job? Job lost his first children, and you know they were sinning. If you read the story, you know they were sinning. Job was worried. Are they lost? He was grieving. Did I not do a good enough job? But then you also know the story of Job's daughters, right? You know that, that whole thing about Job's daughters? There's a group called Job's Daughters today because of Job's, the, the children that God gave Job afterwards. Neither one was Job's fault. Job was a righteous man. But the second set of children were righteous children. The Bible says there was no more beautiful women in the land than Job's daughters in the book of Job at the end of the book. God knows that even Christian parents experience loss. Maybe every one of you parents sitting here today, the older ones anyway, have experienced that. By that I mean you may have experienced loss in the actual death of a child. Or you've experienced loss in the spiritual death of your child because they're no longer following Jesus. God says, the children you will have after you have lost the others will say again in your ears, hmm, the place is too small for me. Give me a place where I may dwell. Verse 21, then you will say in your heart, who has begotten these for me since I have lost my children and am desolate? 
those mothers of you sitting here today who've never been biological mothers, but your mothers, because we call you mothers in Israel, if you're a spiritual woman, if you walk with Christ and you are a spiritual mother, those of you that are biological mothers are both. If, well, biological mothers have no choice. They're biological mothers. But each woman has a choice to be the spiritual mother or not. You must draw close to Christ yourself. Or you have no chance, really, of teaching your children to. The world is so much against us that no matter how well we do, the odds are stacked against us in the world. But our God is able, is he not? Amen. The children you will have after you've lost the others will say again in your ears, the place is too small for me. Give me a place where I may dwell. There's so many of them. And then you will say in your heart, verse 21, who has begotten these for me since I have lost my children and am desolate? I'm a captive, wandering to and fro. Who has brought these up? There I was, left alone. But these, where were they? Thus says the Lord God. Verse 22, behold. Who? Who's talking? The Lord God. Behold, I will lift my hand in an oath to the nations. To who? The nations. That's all the Gentiles. To everyone. And I will set up my standard for the peoples. They shall bring your sons in their arms, and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Kings shall be your foster fathers, and their queens your nursing mothers. They shall bow down to you with their faces to the earth and lick up the dust of your feet. Then, when that happens, then you will know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed. Wow, isn't that amazing? They shall not be ashamed who wait for me. They shall not be ashamed to call God their God. They will not be ashamed to say they believe in Jesus. They will not be ashamed to tell their friends at school, I'm not doing that because that's not what the Lord wants me to do. I'm walking with Him. Amen. They'll invite their friends to church. They'll invite their friends to their things. They'll try to reach out to them. And they won't condemn their friends or judge their friends. They'll grow up learning that. Too many of us adults have already been in that way. What if your children get taken away? Look at verse 24. What if the captive, what if the devil overcomes them? Shall the prey be taken from the mighty? Who's the mighty here? It's talking about the devil. Or human beings who are wicked. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty, or the captives of the righteous be delivered? But thus says the Lord, verse 25, even the captains of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be the delivered, because God says, I will contend with him who contends with you, and I will save your children. Do you believe this? Do you believe in this God? Amen. Mothers, mothers, fathers, brothers and sisters, mothers for evangelism. Unless we fall, as Seventh-day events, in love with evangelism and stop shunning it, Unless we go out to seek and save that which was lost, then we're not that person that God's calling us to be. We're not a light to the Gentiles. Abraham was told by God, I will bless you that you may be a blessing to others. This is the faith of Abraham. In Revelation 14, 12, it says it's the faith of Jesus. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We must not forget it's not just the commandments of God. It's not enough. We need more than God's law. We need God's law, but we need more than God's law. We need Jesus. We need the faith of Jesus. We need faith like Jesus, but we need his faith in us. Look at the patience of Jesus and how he had patience on others. Look how he ministered to others. That's how we should minister. How he reached out to others. That's how we should reach out. When he says, minister to those who are orphans and windows and hungry and thirsty and naked and in prison and a stranger, he means it. How can we challenge ourselves to do that? You know, next Friday, the people coming here may not consider themselves orphans and widows. They may very well be Christians, but they don't know yet all that we know. There's more. And in that respect, they're a little bit uncovered, aren't they? If we know something about the mark of the beast, if we know that it's connected to God's law and specifically to the Sabbath commandment, and they don't know it, where will they be when it hits the fan? Where will they be 
when Sunday laws come? When will they be when other unjust laws come? Where will they be? Many Christians right now are getting on the side well, of the right. It doesn't mean the right side is right because they're ready to be deceived. Others are on the side of the left, same thing. They're not looking at the scriptures or at God holistically. They're, look, they're thinking America is God's special saved nation. And it's not. It's a special place God preserved. But does America follow God? Come on. Look at our laws. Look at what we voted. Should we lobby to change the laws? Should we lobby against abortion? Should we, should we make that our, our aim? Perhaps you might do a little of that, but that's not your main work nor my main work. Our main work is to lobby for the Lord and preach to all of them on both sides, the left and the right, and those in the middle too. That there's more to the story. There's more to salvation. God says, fear him. Give glory to him. The hour of his judgment now is in progress and soon to be over. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to him. Who will have compassion on the once they're borns that they may be born again, that they may be born of water and the spirit? Who will have compassion on the once they're borns that they may be born again for the kingdom of God? God has not forgotten us and he hasn't forgotten them. We have been inscribed on the bloodstained hands of Jesus. Amen.